So I happen to be one of those people who, I, I, I love Christmas. I know some people tolerate it, but I love Christmas. And I love everything about it. I love the food. I love all the lights and decorations. I love the festivities. I love our carol sing every year. I love the music. I love the food. I love the gifts. I love the time with family. I love the food. I love my new Christmas socks. Check those out, huh? That's uh, they're very, very nice, yes. I love the food. I think I... I also love Christmas movies. Anybody here love Christmas movies? Okay, just... So I'm going to just name a few of my favorites and just see if, if, if you love these movies too. All right, first one. I grew up watching this movie with my family every Christmas. Yeah. White Christmas, huh? How many of you, you love White Christmas? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Sisters, sisters. Oh, yeah. I've got it all memorized, man. I've watched it so many times. How about this one? It's a wonderful life, huh? Yeah. I, I got to tell you, that, that actually happens to be my favorite Christmas movie of all time. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Oh, yeah. You know, I can't tell. I probably, I've probably seen that movie 50 times. I still cry at the ending every single time. Sheesh. How about this one? Miracle on 34th Street, huh? They've made several versions of this, but the old 1930s version, that's, that's the black and white one. That's still the very best one, right? Susan sitting in the back of the car, trying to convince herself, I believe, I believe. Stop the car, Uncle Fred. There it was. The I still cry at that one, too. I'm a sap. It's terrible. Elf. Huh? Oh, yeah. Some of you love Elf, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we elves stick to the four main food groups. Y'all know what those are? Candy, candy canes, candy corns, and syrup. Oh, that's a healthy diet right there. Then there's a Christmas story. Huh? The Red Rider BB gun. Ralphie, you'll shoot your eye out. And then, of course, that heartwarming special Christmas classic. Yes, Die Hard. Yeah, little known fact, this really is a Christmas movie. I've got a machine gun now. Ho, ho, ho. That's right. All right, I love Christmas movies, but now, now comes true confession time, all right? True confession, I even watch Hallmark Christmas movies. Oh, wow, I see there's, there's a bunch of you that are watching those, huh? Yeah, in fact, do you know how many people watched Hallmark Christmas movies last year, 2017? 85 million. 80, oh, whoa, she says, yeah. 85 million people, and they're on track this year for an even higher number. And uh, Hallmark has kind of come up with the secret sauce for this deal, right? They've got, a, they've got this thing they do that uh, it works. And it's real simple. Snow, romance, and a happy ending. Boom. You can walk into a Hallmark Christmas movie any time in the movie. Five minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour and a half. You already know what's going on. You know right where you are. They're all the same. And as crazy as it sounds, it's, uh, it's made Hallmark the most profitable network on TV. It's fascinating. In fact, here's a little known statistic. Ready? 2010, so eight years ago, how many original Hallmark Christmas movies did they make in 2010? Six. They made six of them. Each year since then, they realized how, what a, a pot of gold these were. So each year since then, they've increased that. This year, 2018, how many original Hallmark Christmas movies have they made? 38. 38 of them. That's right. If you're a binge watcher, you can go home and watch original new Hallmark Christmas movies for over three days straight. That's the ultimate in binge watching right there. Although once you've watched one, you've watched them all. They're all the same. But anyway, I have to confess that Lane and I even have the app on our phone. Forgive me, Lord. All right, so I love Hallmark, I love Christmas movies, uh, I love Christmas, but I've got to tell you something, the Christmas story, the real Christmas story will never be made into a Hallmark Christmas movie, ever. And the reason is it's just way too raw and messy. In fact, the real Christmas story is closer to Die Hard than it is to Miracle on 34th Street. In fact, I actually thought about entitling this message Die Hard instead of Surviving Christmas. 
but I thought that was a little edgy. <laughs> Truly, it's, it's kind of like this edge-of-your-seat adventure story. It's a story that begins with a small-town sexual scandal, and it ends with a young couple fleeing with their infant child from a murderous king and ending up living in a foreign country as political refugees, as exiles. It's a story that makes you wonder how Rudolph or Frosty or even Hallmark could hold our interest when the real story is so gripping, so compelling. And so what I want to do is tell you the story with some help from some friends and then finish with one big takeaway. So really simple, We're going to tell the story, one big takeaway. Does that sound good? Okay, the real story begins in Nazareth with a young man named Joseph. What has she done? I don't know what to think. I need more time. Joseph. All right, so here it comes. Number one on your outline, the Christmas story, raw and messy. This story starts in Nazareth. Now, that's interesting because it doesn't start in Rome, in Athens, or even in Jerusalem. It starts in Nazareth. Do you know where Nazareth is? It's a tiny village, a backwater village in Galilee. Nazareth was in the sticks. Do you all know what the sticks are? Huh? Okay. Nazareth was in the sticks. And if you're from Nazareth, what does that make you? A hick from the sticks. That's right. And if you, if you think I'm making this up, 30 years after Jesus was born, when Nathaniel is first introduced to Jesus and he discovers that Jesus is from Nazareth, do you know what Nathaniel's response was? Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? This place was the sticks, and this is where our story starts. Joseph is a young carpenter in Nazareth engaged to a local girl named Mary. Mary turns up pregnant, and Joseph knows that he's not the father. This is a scandal in Nazareth. Everyone in the village is talking. Sadly, you know, today, we hardly blink when someone gets pregnant out of wedlock. But the Bible treats sex as a sacred thing that's to be shared between a man and a woman in marriage. And they understood that in Nazareth in that day. And so when Mary, unmarried Mary, shows up pregnant, everyone's talking. It's scandalous. Joseph insisted that he was not the father. No one was buying it. And Mary, oh my word, Mary came up with a story uh, about an angel visit and a virgin birth. How do you think that was selling in Nazareth? Not so well. Mary was ostracized, her parents were ashamed, her neighbors scandalized, and her fiancé humiliated. And friends, that's just the opening scene of the story. It has a very inauspicious beginning. So here's Joseph, humiliated, but he's a kind man, and decided to end the engagement quietly. But God visits Joseph in a dream and informs him that Mary's telling the truth, that the baby in her womb is from the Holy Spirit. God tells him that it's a boy. I love that. How's that for a gender reveal? <laughs> it's a boy, and the baby's to be named Jesus. And Jesus means, the name Jesus means, the Lord saves, or God to the rescue. Because this baby would save his people from their sins. So Joseph wakes up, and when he wakes up, he does what God instructed him to do in the dream. But here's the question I have. Do you think Joseph ever second-guessed himself? Do you think Joseph ever had any doubts? Like, did I really dream that? Was that really God or was it just bad pizza? <laughs> I think he had to have some of those thoughts. Joseph knew that if he took Mary as his wife, most people would assume that this was an implicit acknowledgement that he was the baby's father. Joseph knew that by saying yes to God, he would spend the rest of his life living under this cloud of scandal. But fortunately, Joseph's devotion to God was greater than his concern for his reputation, so he and Mary were quietly married. Well, a few months later, when Mary was near full term, word came that the Roman government expected everyone to register in the census. Now, you might wonder, why the census? And uh, it's for one real simple pur uh, purpose, follow the money, right? It was for what? 
Taxation, right. They wanted to, to tax them. And here's the deal. A Roman army was occupying Israel at the time. The Jews were fiercely independent, valued their freedom, and hated the Roman occupation. The only thing they hated worse than the Roman occupation was paying for it. And they had to pay for it through these taxes. But it wasn't just the money that was at stake. It was the disruption from this census. Every family was required to return to their ancestral home to register. And for Joseph, this meant a trip to Bethlehem with his very pregnant wife. It meant 70 miles riding on a donkey or walking. All the moms in the room, remember when you were eight or nine months pregnant? How does a 70-mile donkey trip sound to you? <laughs> Pretty awful, doesn't it? This is a story of oppression by a foreign government, of taxation without representation. It's a messy, messy story, and it gets even worse. When Joseph and Mary finally get to Bethlehem, the village is crowded with many other people just like them, folks who've been uprooted for the census. Now, most of the families in Bethlehem, in their very small, modest homes, would have had one room that was considered a guest room. Unfortunately, because there were so many guests in Bethlehem, all those rooms were full when Joseph and Mary arrived. And so they had to take shelter in a stable. And there in the stable, Mary gave birth to a son and laid him in a manger. Now, I know when you put it like that, it kind of sounds romantic, doesn't it? But it wasn't romantic at all. It was messy. In fact, imagine, again, all you moms out there, imagine being a teenage mother, because Mary was most likely a teenager. Imagine being a teenage mom, far from home, utterly alone, giving birth to your first child in a barn. It would have been a terrifying experience. No beautiful crib, no custom nursery. Most of our nativity scenes that we have in our homes are lovely, but they mask the glaring poverty and political oppression of this holy night. The king of kings was born in a barn. He was cradled in a feeding trough far from home in the middle of nowhere. The whole story is just messy, and then it gets weird. Who are you? We saw the star and followed it to Jerusalem. Herod and his priests told us the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. He told us, find the child so I can worship him. And then the star led us here. Is that the child? Yes, his name is Jesus. I said it gets weird, and you might be wondering, well, what's weird about the Magi? We three kings of Orient are, right? That whole thing. Well, here's the deal. The Magi were actually Persian or Babylonian priests of a pagan religion. They were experts in astrology, that is, reading signs in the stars, fortune-telling, and other occult practices. All of these practices, by the way, outlawed by the Jewish religious law. So when Joseph and Mary hear the knock on the door, this is not whom they were expecting. They knew their son was the Jewish Messiah. So who would you expect to come and pay homage to that Jewish Messiah? The Jewish leaders, right? The Jewish priests, the elders. And instead, they never came. People who knew the scriptures and the promises, these people never came. Instead, it was these foreigners with their outlawed religious practices who show up and worship the king. It's just weird. It's unexpected. And why were they there? Well, God had shown them a star. Remember, they were astrologers. They read the stars. God told them, follow this star. It will lead you to a king. And they'd come to worship. It's interesting that the only ones worshiping the newborn king were these outsiders, these people from a completely different religion. It might have been God's way to indicate that from the very beginning, Jesus was not going to be just the Jewish Messiah, but the Savior of the world. Amen. That Jesus is for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. Can you imagine Joseph and Mary's confusion, though, as these foreigners, these strangers to the Jewish faith, bowed down to worship their son? Joseph and Mary must have been thinking, my word, what is going on? By the way, the Bible doesn't say that there were three magi. We've deduced that from what? From the gifts, right, the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
Each of these gifts, by the way, would have been fantastically expensive. Gifts, treasures, the likes of which Joseph and Mary had never seen or even imagined. What in the world were they to do with riches like this? Well, we'll see in a moment. So the Magi had started their search for the new king where you would expect to find him, in the capital, in Jerusalem, at the palace. There they asked King Herod where the new king might be. Well, Herod was disturbed by this news that there was a new king. Herod was insanely insecure. More about him in a moment. And he asked the Jewish religious experts, where's the Messiah to be born? They told him Bethlehem. And he asked the Magi, when did you first see the star? And then he told them to go to Bethlehem, find the new king, and then come back and report to him so that he too could go and offer his worship. But Herod never intended to worship Jesus, of course. He intended to kill him. We are not going back to Herod. We've had dreams. He's dangerous. Beware. Joseph. Where are they? Your Majesty, we don't know, but they're calling him the King of the Jews. I am the only King of the Jews. I will leave no doubt. Mary, we have to go. So after the Magi had found Jesus, God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. Instead, they escaped back to their own country by another route. Now, Herod, I got to tell you, King Herod, he was known as Herod the Great, was a piece of work. This guy was something. He was known for his cruelty, his instability, and his jealousy. Anyone whom he perceived as a threat to his throne, he had murdered. Now, here's the problem. Herod married ten wives. Friends, that's nine too many, just so you know. He married 10 wives, he had numerous children, and this huge extended family tended to foment political intrigue, which led to scores of assassinations and executions. Herod executed some of his own wives, his own sisters, and here's the fascinating thing, he even executed his three eldest sons, the young men who would have been heirs to his throne. And if he thought that they were trying to take over, he just had them eliminated. There was actually a joke in Israel because Herod uh, was a, a, a nominal practicing Jew and kept the Jewish food laws, which means he didn't eat pork. The joke was that it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. This is the man to whom the Magi unwittingly went looking for the new king. And of course, Herod, when he heard this news, was insanely jealous and had no intention of letting this new rival survive. So when it became clear that the Magi had outwitted him, Herod was furious and he ordered that all the baby boys in Bethlehem, age two and under, be killed, based on the time he'd learned from the Magi. Soldiers descended on the unsuspecting village one night and ran their swords through Bethlehem's baby boys. It's called the Massacre of the Innocents. And I doubt you'll find it in any Christmas movie Hallmark or otherwise. It's the messiest part of a very messy story. And how did Jesus survive this first Christmas? Well, once again, God intervenes by giving Joseph a dream. God told Joseph to get up right now, that very night, get up and escape to Egypt because Herod was going to try to kill the child. They were to stay in Egypt until, Her until God told them to come home, which of course would be after Herod died. Now I want you to imagine this. Imagine Joseph waking his young wife and son, packing in the dark, explaining that they were fleeing in the middle of the night, seeking asylum in Egypt because Herod wanted to kill the baby. Imagine Mary as they, as they fled, looking over her shoulder, fearing the armed pursuit of Herod's troops. The whole thing must have been absolutely terrifying. The Holy Family literally had to run for their lives in the middle of the night. It was a narrow escape. They barely got away with their lives. And then they end up in Egypt, they show up on the border of Egypt as political refugees. What kind of welcome do you think they got there?
Things don't change that much, do they, folks? And I don't imagine that they were welcomed in Egypt. Have you ever thought about this? That Jesus started his life as a dreamer, a DACA recipient, taken by his parents as an infant to a foreign country where they lived as exiles, fleeing for their lives from political oppression. That's where the story starts. What a mess it was. And then finally, it was time to go home. Joseph. Mary, the angel spoke to me. He said, we can return home. Herod's son rules, so when we return, we have to go to Nazareth. We've been unsettled for so long. Bethlehem, Egypt, now Nazareth. I wonder, is it all worth it? Is it worth it? So God promised to let Joseph know when it was safe to go home, and he speaks to him in a dream. And so Joseph, again, packs up his family in Egypt. They move back to Israel. But back in Israel, he learns that Herod's brother, Archelaus, is ruling in his state, in his place. Uh, this was, of course, not very reassuring. And Joseph fears for the safety of his family. And once again, another dream. This is the fourth dream Joseph has. They move again, this time back up to Nazareth, back to the place where Joseph's reputation still is in tatters. Three times Joseph moves his family, each time based on a dream. I want to just pause there for a second. Think about that. Wives, all the, all the wives in the room. How are you going to feel if tomorrow morning you get up and your husband says, honey, we're moving. I had a dream last night. Probably not going to be too excited about that, are you? And Mary has this experience multiple times in, in this story. I, I, I think, what a shaky, crazy start that is. You know, we moved a lot when I was a kid. Uh, from kindergarten to seventh grade, I was in 11 different schools. And we moved because of my dad's job. No one was trying to kill me. But all of that moving, that's a little disturbing, isn't it? Upsetting. Surviving Christmas. So who survived that first Christmas? The answer is Jesus did, but barely escaped with his life. Joseph and Mary did, again, barely escaping with their lives. It's a crazy, messy story of political intrigue, of deceit, of murder, running for your life. But mostly, it's a beautiful story of spiritual pursuit. That God, the hero of the story, is quietly working through all of the mess and craziness, pursuing you, pursuing me. God's the hero of the story who sends his son into the world to save it, who calls magi from a distant nation to come and worship and ultimately provide for his son and protects his son from a jealous king by giving them dreams through a young carpenter. God comes to the rescue. Truly, the name of Jesus was appropriate. God to the rescue. Friends, God went to a lot of trouble to save you, didn't he? He went to a lot of trouble to save you. So, okay, so there's kind of the, the, the Christmas story, raw and messy. Why did I take the time to unpack this whole crazy, messy, raw, true story of Christmas? Why not just the warm, fuzzy Hallmark version? Here's why. Because my life's not a Hallmark movie, and neither is yours. Am I right? Our lives are messy. Our lives are messy, and I need to know that there is a God who works in the mess. And that's the big idea I want to take home with you. Number two in your outline Here's the takeaway. We did the story. Here's the takeaway. It'll be short and simple. Number two, God is at work in the mess. This is really good news, friends. There is a God who's at work in your mess too. In fact, would you turn to the person next to you, look him in the eye, and just tell him, God's at work in your mess. God's at work in your mess. The message of the Christmas story is that God stepped into our mess. He stepped into our world. He became one of us. We call it the incarnation, a word that means literally in the flesh. God came in the flesh. Or as I like to say, Jesus is God in a bod. God came in the flesh. God became one of us. God stepped into our skin and lived as a human being. God became one of us to save all of us. 
God became one of us to save all of us. Jesus really is God to the rescue, stepping into our mess to lead us out of it and back to himself. And of course, the big question then becomes why? Why did God do it? Why step into our mess? Why go to all this trouble? And the answer goes back to the very first bit of good news I gave you at the start of the message. For God so loved the world. The reason that God stepped into our mess, friends, is simply because he's crazy about you. He loves you more than you can imagine. Max Lucado said it this way. He said, there are many reasons God saves you, but one of the sweetest is that he's so fond of you. God likes having you around. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a cell phone, your photo would be on there. You know, when I hold mine up, you can't see it from where you are, but guess whose photo is on my cell phone? My grandkids, that's right, my grandkids. Whenever you wanna talk, he'll listen. God could live anywhere in the universe, and he does, but he chose to live in you. And the Christmas gift he sent you in Bethlehem, well, face it, friends, he's crazy about you. Here's why God pursued us. This is why God stepped into our world. This is why God took on human flesh, because he loves you and he wants you. Think about that. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And he wants it bad enough to pursue you this ferociously. Augustine wrote in the fourth century, God became a man... So that following a man, something you are able to do, you might reach God, which was formerly impossible to you. Jesus made it possible for us to find our way back to God. Jesus made it possible for us to experience a relationship with God. Jesus made the invisible God visible. He made it possible for us to know God. Jesus is God in the flesh, the one who stepped into our mess to rewrite our stories. So Matt Proctor explained it this way. This is a beautiful little story. Matt says, my five-year-old Carl and my three-year-old Conrad love it when I dress like them. When they put on jeans and a blue T-shirt, they'll ask me to wear jeans and a blue T-shirt. And when I do, they'll look at me and then they'll look at each other and they'll say, see, Dad, same, same. Same, same. For my birthday, Carl bought me a North Carolina blue mesh shirt because he has a North Carolina blue mesh shirt. He bought it for me so we could be same, same. When I play living room football with my boys, Conrad will not let me play standing up. I'm too big and scary, towering above him. The theological term for this is completely other. Instead, Conrad insists that I get on my knees, and when I'm down there at eye level with him, Conrad puts his hand on my shoulder and says, there, Dad, see? Same, same. They like it when I enter their world. This summer, I scraped my leg working on my house. When Conrad fell down and scraped his leg, he pointed at my scab, then showed me his and said, see, Dad? Same, same. Here's the point. God himself has felt what we feel. In the incarnation, God chose not to stay completely other. Instead, God got down at eye level. Same, same. And God experienced what it's like to be human, to be tired, to be discouraged, to be anxious, to be fearful. God knows what it's like to hurt and to bleed. God even knows what it's like to be tempted. Same, same. In your mess, you may be tempted to say, God, you have no idea what I'm going through. You have no idea how badly I'm hurting. But God can always respond, yes, I do. He can point to your wounds and then to his own and say, look, same, same. Me too. I've entered your world. I know how you feel. I've been there, and I'm here with you now. I care, and I can help. Friends, this is what Christmas is all about. This is what the Christmas story is about, that God stepped into the mess, that God entered our human world, very human world, and lived among us as one of us. And he did all this so that he can help us. Jesus really is God to the rescue, working right in the middle of our mess. So I want to finish with two beautiful passages from the book of Hebrews, and uh, then we'll light the candles. Here are the two passages. First one, Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Here's what it says. For this reason, he, Jesus, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful 
and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to what? To help. He's able to help those who are being tempted. What a beautiful verse. It says Jesus was fully human. Same, same. Just like us. And that because of that, because Jesus suffered, that he's able to help. He's able to help those who are suffering or being tempted. Because Jesus is like us. Same, same. He's able to to help. Then Hebrews 4, 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace, again, to what? To help us. Grace to help us in our time of need. Once again, he says this same idea that Jesus has been one of us. Same, same. And because of that, he understands, he empathizes with our weaknesses. Jesus has been in the mess with us. And so it says, you can come to God with confidence. You never need to hold back fearfully or anxious that God won't accept you. Instead, simply come to him as you are. In the middle of your mess, come to him and you'll find mercy and grace to help you. So here's the idea I want to leave you with. It's a real simple idea. Friends, invite Jesus into your mess. Invite Jesus into your mess. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to invite him into our hearts? That's the Hallmark version. I'm giving you the real version today. Invite Jesus into your mess. In fact, I probably could just tell you that inviting Jesus into your heart and into your mess is really the same thing, isn't it? Because our hearts tend to be a little messy. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But are there some of you here that this week you've said something, done something, thought something, or felt something that you look back and went, oh, that wasn't so good? Our hearts are messy, are they not? And our lives are messy. And sometimes when we're that way, when, when we've done the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, oftentimes our response is to run and hide from God, fearful of his judgment. We do what Adam and Eve did when they committed that first sin. They didn't go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry. Look what I've done. Please forgive me. Instead, they ran and hid from God. We tend to do the same thing. And the author of Hebrews says, don't do that because our high priest, Jesus, knows what it's like to be human. He's lived in your skin. He understands what it's like. So come to him with boldness and confidence that you'll receive mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. Now, I know there are a few of you in the room that right now are thinking, Good on you, Joe. You're telling all those messed up people to go to Jesus. But I'm doing pretty darn well. If you are, we applaud you. God bless you. But here's what I want to remind you. If your life is not a mess right now, hang on. It will be soon. Am I right? Because the mess, friends, is just the human condition. It's what all of us face and live with at different times. And again, the good news is that Jesus has stepped into the mess. So when the mess hits, you can turn to him. Invite Jesus into your mess. Jesus may not fix the mess entirely, but here's what he will do. He'll change you. He'll make you more alive. He'll reconnect you with God. Inviting Jesus into your mess, best decision you'll ever make. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray for a moment. I want to give you a moment just to whisper that invitation to him. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, step into my mess. Jesus, help me. Help me. And you can whisper it any way you want, but would you do that right now? Just invite Jesus into your life. Best decision you'll ever make. Lord, all across this room, I believe men and women are whispering that prayer to you and you hear them, however they say it, you hear them. And I pray that walking out of here today, they'll walk out changed with a new strength, a new power inside them. That today could be the beginning of a new relationship with God that would transform them right where they are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming that first Christmas. But thank you that you're still stepping into our lives and bringing your redemptive work, God, to the rescue. We pray that you come and rescue us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now's the time to take out that candle you were given when you came in. We're going to light the candles. 
And here's how it's going to work. I'm going to invite the ushers if they'll go ahead and come on down front here. And uh, I'm going to come down with a single lit candle. I'll light the ushers and they're going to come up the aisles and they'll light the candle of the person on the end of the aisle and then we'll just pass the light on down the aisle. And of course, what this beautiful picture represents is that Jesus, that first candle, is the light of the world who brings his light and his life into the middle of our darkness and lights our lives up and changes things. Let's light the candles. Now, usually I tell you not to blow hot wax on your neighbor, but this year, just go ahead. Puff that thing. <laughs> we 
wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good tidings we bring to you and your kin. Good tidings of Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, everyone. Angels we have heard.